My name is Catherine Bliss, and I'm a senior fellow and deputy director within the Global Health Policy Center here at CSIS. And on behalf of the Global Health Policy Center, along with the CSIS Africa program, the Americas program, the Freeman Chair in China Studies, the Russia and Eurasia program, and the Wadwani Chair in U.S.-India Studies, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this morning's seminar on emerging practices in global health cooperation, which focuses on the increasingly influential roles of Brazil, China, India, Russia, and South Africa within the global health landscape. Now, it was almost exactly 10 years ago this week that Goldman Sachs analyst Jim O'Neill coined the term BRIC to refer to the emerging economies he believed were poised to surpass the G7 in terms of economic growth in the coming years. And although at the time, the term BRIC was, was just kind of a convenient name to refer to those economies as a group, the governments themselves found that they had common interests beyond the basic questions of economic growth and global economic and financial governance and began to work to coordinate their positions on a variety of issues through formal and informal mechanisms. Now, in 2011, the BRIC Alliance or Association officially incorporated South Africa, formalizing the BRICS moniker. And in July of this year, health ministers from the BRICS met in China for the first time to exchange views on global health challenges and to affirm their commitment to promote the BRICS as a forum for coordination, cooperation, and consultation on relevant matters related to global health. Now, the Beijing Declaration released at the conclusion of that meeting outlines a broad agenda focused on reform of the World Health Organization, the promotion of universal access to health care within the BRICS themselves, and in cooperation with other countries along the development path, and an emphasis on the importance of honoring flexibilities within the TRIPS agreement to ensure widespread access to medicines and vaccines. Now, as many of you know, because many of you have attended events here in recent months, CSIS has been carrying out analysis related to the BRICS and global health for about the past year and a half. Building on international influence in the, or international interest in the influence of the BRICS within global governance schemes, generally, we have asked a series of questions related to global health specifically. What is the history of each country's engagement in the global health arena? What philosophy or ideology guides each nation's global health outreach and cooperation? What is the relationship between each country's domestic health conditions and its international work on health? What kinds of legislation and bureaucratic arrangements support the government's work on global health? What are the most relevant regional and bilateral partners? And looking toward the future, what are the implications for the United States and other perhaps more traditional actors in the global health field, and what are the opportunities for partnership and cooperation? Now, in November of 2010, we published a preliminary report called Key Players in Global Health, in which researchers from our regional programs here at CSIS offered initial assessments of each of the country's motivations, ideologies, and practices in the global health arena. That publication also included analyses by colleagues within the CSIS Europe program, and the Chair in Korea Studies, as well as from Chatham House in London. And those authors considered the prospects that South Korea and France might incorporate health as a key element of their respective G20 summits that they would host in November of 2010 and November of 2011. Between May and November of this year, CSIS worked with independent research organizations in each country to plan co-hosted workshops to deepen understanding of some of the issues and to develop common agendas for investigation and analysis. On May 19th in Moscow, we co-hosted a session on Russia's leadership on global health with the Higher School for Economics International Organizations Research Institute. On May 24th, we co-hosted with the China Institute of International Studies a discussion on the potential for US and China collaboration on health in Sub-Saharan Africa. On August 25th, we co-hosted with the South African Institute for International Affairs a session on South Africa's regional, South-South, and international relations on health. And on November 7th, CSIS and the Center for International Relations on Health at Brazil's Fiocruz in Rio de Janeiro co-hosted a session on the ways in which emerging forms of trilateral cooperation are influencing global health practices. Now, a collection of papers from the May 24th Beijing conference entitled China's Emerging Global Health and Foreign Engagement in Africa has recently been released, and reports from the Russia, South Africa, and Brazil workshops should be available soon. So today we wrap up this first phase of work on the BRICS with a seminar featuring experts on health policy, 
development, foreign policy, and the changing nature of international relations related to global health and overseas assistance. Many of our speakers participated as hosts, local experts, or visiting speakers in Moscow, Beijing, Johannesburg, and the Rio conferences. Others bring their expertise as observers and practitioners of global health cooperation to their roles today. So we've planned today's discussion around two sessions. In the first, we have asked three panelists to consider the relationships between the BRICS countries and the multilateral institutions that are most important to them for health, including the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization and TRIPS issues, and the G20, among others. In the second, four experts will offer their perspectives on the importance of South-South cooperation, trilateral cooperation, and regional relationships to the BRICS emerging global health activities. Following each the presentations, we will have time for questions and comments from the audience. And I hope that you will be able to, to stay for both sessions as your schedules permit. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the chair and moderator of our first session. Dr. Judith Twigg is professor at Virginia Commonwealth University and senior associate within the CSIS Russia and Eurasia program. Uh, Judy is an internationally recognized expert on issues related to health and Russia. And she chaired the public health working group of the Civil Society Summit during the US-Russia presidential summit in Moscow in July of 2009. More recently, she took the lead for CSIS in organizing the May 2011 seminar with the Higher Economics School in Moscow, and she has been a vital member of the CSIS uh, BRICS, BRICS group over the past two years. Uh, so Judy, let me turn to you. Thank you very much, Catherine. As Catherine said, uh, this first panel is dedicated to discussing the engagement of the BRICS countries with international organizations. And Catherine has asked the panelists to address three distinct issues in their remarks. The first is the importance of multilateral relationships to the engagement of the BRICS countries on global health issues. The second is an assessment of the priority relationships, the priority organizations, the priority associations within the multilateral arena. And the third question addresses the themes or the topics that the BRICS countries are most engaged with through multilateral channels. So we'll have three speakers. We've asked them each to give remarks of about 20 minutes, and that will leave us plenty of time for questions and discussion afterwards. And I'll introduce each of the panelists as they speak. Our first panelist is Dr. Peter Forey. He is the Specialist Technical Advisor with the AIDS Foundation of South Africa. His research focuses on issues concerning global health governance, political epidemiology, and the political economy of global development. Dr. Forey. He also normally has quite a soothing baritone voice, but um, I seem to have brought a vicious South African virus with me, so uh, I'll be speaking with a voice that is not my own, and I'll also treat you to a rather severe Afrikaans accent, so good luck to us all. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. There we go. Right. Thank you very much to the CSIS for this invitation to speak here today. Uh, global health is not an issue that has traction in South Africa uh, as a member of BRICS. It's not an arena of struggle that we seem to be exploiting after the end of apartheid. Um, although it is extremely necessary, it's interesting that the Afrobarometer data indicates that South, African, uh, South Africans don't really deem AIDS a particularly interesting topic or something that they think about when they make electoral decisions. So it will be interesting as we move forward and as South Africa is the latest or the newest BRICS member to see whether that issue finds uh, a place on the official agenda going into the future. So I'll focus mostly on the S in BRICS and I'll put my cards on the table. I'm, I'm a skeptic. Probably I don't think uh, South Africa belongs in the BRICS conglomerate. Um, we don't seem to fit the profile of the other countries there. Mexico certainly seems to be an obvious one, but not so much South Africa. That's if you believe the metrics. If you think about it ideologically, maybe we do belong there, but those are the kinds of issues that I'll address later on. 
My bottom line is in the second half of the presentation, namely that South Africa and BRICS, I think, can use health issues and HIV and AIDS in particular as a filter through which they can project their soft power globally or internationally and certainly in the multilateral arena. And that's not really happening. It hasn't happened and it's not on any agenda, probably mostly due to the shambolic nature of South African foreign policy making itself. But if we can sort that out, uh, it would be possible, I think, to, to do something quite constructive in the multilateral arena around HIV and AIDS and a kind of evolving AIDS diplomacy in particular, which is an appendix to, to health diplomacy in particular. Uh, you see my affiliation there. I'll be moving to the University of Stellenbosch next February, so that's a temporary affiliation. Um, and then my email address at the bottom would be an easier place to get hold of me uh, as of very soon. So, in this presentation, I'll have a quick glance at the BRICS uh, on the whole. This presentation is probably a bit of a framing exercise as well, I hope, because uh, it is fairly broad, although I, I pull it together towards the end. I'll then talk about the Global South and its uh, affinity for multilateralism, with the BRICS being an idea within an evolving uh, southern solidarity shift towards multilateral global politics. Then I'll express my uh, surprise, really, that South Africa now is officially a member of that grouping. And uh, I'll talk about the place of global health within this evolving multilateral order where the, the BRICS want to play an important role. I'll then talk about, reflect on the dual crisis of global health deficits in the developing world and the global financial crisis. So there are two crises happening here at the same time. And I'll make the case, or I'll try to, that uh, we shouldn't lose this crisis. We should make the most of these dual crises because there are opportunities for learning and transformation, which I don't think the Global South or South Africa are using. The Global South probably can benefit from here this using health diplomacy. If you don't have enough resources, then certainly uh, a focus on health would make it easier uh, again to project ourselves and our soft power internationally and AIDS diplomacy in particular would be an area that we we know most about uh, in South Africa and then right at the end I'll come to the three questions that Judy noted uh, in her introduction. So there's a family photo that's the the BRICS nations it certainly is impressive on paper a third of the world's population a combined GDP that's not insignificant Combined foreign reserves, that's not insignificant, especially given recent global geopolitical developments, with the stated goal to reform financial institutions and to become more involved, I think is what the document says. But, but there's a, a need, a willingness, an expression of interest in becoming, projecting oneself in the, in the global arena. Multilateralism is particularly seductive to countries in the global south, simply because we do not have any ambitions for global dominance, uh, some of us more than others, certainly China, certainly Russia. But the other three, I don't think, have ambitions for projecting on the global stage in terms of becoming superpowers. So multilateralism is a good accommodation of states who are not really small states, but have some kind of traction, some kind of capital. And in South Africa's case, a kind of a moral high ground, I think, still capitalizing on the spirit of Nelson Mandela. Um, to be a player in the global political economy in particular. So the BRICS is seen as an alternative to the status quo, which is dominated by the global north, and it provides a beautiful opportunity to use, as I state there, lovely old-fashioned post-colonial discourses. You made us poor, you sustain the uh, development of underdevelopment internationally. It's excellent for apportioning blame. Um, it can provide a good forum, a good opportunity to become more assertive for more commerce, certainly in the Global South in particular, and as stated in the goals of BRICS, to become more assertive in changing the rules of the financial game, although the BRICS haven't been particularly active in that over the last year and in Basel III. So I would say that the BRICS as an idea, to me, and again, maybe, maybe this is slightly cynical, is an opportunity for realism dressed up as idealism using the language of the old Marxists. 
but uh, there's a bit of a it's promiscuous I think in terms of the the discourses that BRICS enables and that makes it very seductive particularly given the penchant for multilateralism in the global south these days what complicates that is the fact that BRICS is not a monolith yes I think we are bound in the BRICS countries for our, by our quest for soft power. Two members, of course, are also, I think, quite explicitly interested in hard power. Um, but there are also factors that divide us quite explicitly. South Africa is an odd outlier. If you look at the metrics, economically, geographically, and demographically, we simply don't belong there. Um, there's history of tensions, recent tensions between key participants in the BRICS project, India and China, recent wars. There are very explicit selfish impulses with China and South Africa wanting to be co-emperors of African resources. Um, and South Africa, ironically enough, of course, acting as a colonial power in the, in, on the rest of the African continent and not particularly well liked for that. Russia and China seem to have global ambitions. The others do not yet to that large an extent. India is criticized for needing to be loved by the United States. Um, and there are competing multilateralisms. There's IPSA, which seems to be an interesting forum where countries that are more alike in terms of those metrics, uh, and of course the G20 that might attract more attention than the BRICS nation themselves. So the BRICS is new, it's unsettled, it's not particularly well focused at the moment. So there is scepticism. I want to say a bit more about South Africa and its presence in the BRICS. As I said, the metrics show that we do not belong there. But I think ideologically and pragmatically, it makes sense for South Africa to be there. So it depends how you argue it. South Africa, especially under Thabo Mbeki as president, was quite strong in putting forth a, a post-colonial position uh, in the Global South in particular and wanting to play that kingmaker almost in terms of solidarity amongst nations in the global south. Unfortunately, we are unable to get our foreign policy right. We've been spectacularly bad at it. The bad health policy that we had until about three years ago, I think, overshadowed the really shoddy nature of South African foreign policy making. Of course, in 1994, we used to be a pariah state. The prodigal returns as a middle power becomes then very quickly what the Washington Post in 2008 called a rogue democracy. There simply is no sense to how we vote in the UN and in the UN Security Council. Or is there? Maybe there's some kind of agenda going on there. South Africa seems to be quite willing to give the middle finger to the priorities of the Global North and the members of the P5 in particular. But it's not particularly well expressed uh, in formal foreign policy documents. But we do project ourselves as a champion of multilateralism, a firebrand for southern solidarity. We pretend to wanting to be everything for the rest of Africa, but we're not. We're very selfish, and, uh, but we are a regional giant. So we went through a lot of phases in terms of foreign policy making. We haven't really settled. And I think it's useful to remember that South Africa as a global player really is only 17 years old in its new iteration and we very much are the adolescent. We've moved from that pariah and practicing the diplomacy of circumvention to Mandela's wonderful idealistic but unpredictable foreign policy making and his flip-flop policies on Taiwan, China certainly was illustrative here. But I spoke to people at the Department of Foreign Affairs a few years ago who said that you can't criticize Mandela but he was he was a nightmare to work with in terms of foreign policy making because he would decide on the day. You know, it was really normally he would make good decisions, but not always. And Becky, of course, difficult to follow in Mandela's uh, footsteps, but very much an African nationalist, much clearer sense of what he wants to do globally, but certainly global health not present there as a mainstay of his foreign policy making. He desperately, of course, tried to have a conversation about the social determinants of health, but then was seduced by crazy people on the fringes, and then was so conceited that he couldn't escape from that and became the, the victim of that. So we had to disentangle ourselves from all of that. We've really befuddled our, our presence in terms of global health views. We haven't been able to return to 
a sensible conversation about the social determinants of health and the political economy thereof globally, which I think would be really useful. And that, towards the end of this, I would argue is where AIDS can come in. We can reclaim that moral high ground and have a serious conversation about global inequities, global unfairness, social injustice. I don't even want to mention the current guy, Jacob Zuma, um, shambolic, chaotic foreign policy, no norm entrepreneurial flair whatsoever, and eminently inward looking. And the recent drama around the issuing of a visa for the Dalai Lama's visit, I think, is a clear illustration of that. I don't know if you're aware of that recent drama. Essentially, the Department of Home Affairs just waited until the Dalai Lama gave up. He did put in an application for a visa. The presidency refused to comment on it, and they just didn't issue it until he withdrew his application. And then they said, oh, oh we would have approved it. And then it kind of went away. So there's no planning, there's no strategy, really, in terms of foreign policy making. And only recently did it come out that, yes, South Africa was playing a Chinese game around the, the Dalai Lama. Uh, didn't want to upset Beijing. Within this context, in all of this, global health is new. Global health, I think the importance of it is the fact that since the, sec since the end of the Cold War, when we moved from international health to global health, has been multilateralized. And that is a point that I will make a little bit later as well. Um, it fits the profile of foreign policy making an activity that the BRICS countries, as well as South Africa, hold dear. We have multilateralized the way in which global health is managed, and it fits nicely with the modus operandi of countries, serious large countries in the global south. The fact, however, is that there is a multitude of actors, multitude of agendas, and it's difficult to see whether there's any kind of, of pattern. All of this is fairly new. I mean, I, do, I don't have to tell this audience this kind of history, but over the last 150 years or so, uh, first there was an international conference on cholera in 1851, and since then we have quite actively, globally, multilateralized the way in which global health is managed. Eventually the World Health Organization established almost as an afterthought in 1946, with some successes leading to a sense that we have conquered nature by the 1950s, early 1960s. And it was early, only by the 1990s that we rediscovered our sense of, of common fear. We don't, our common insecurity is the pathogens and the issues around global health and the absence of certainty. With the emergence of new pandemics and HIV and AIDS in particular, all of that drove the multilateralization of responses to global health. International non-governmental organizations were set up. Transnational civil society became more and more important. Multilateralism, multilateralization of health issues was the, the name of the game. Of course, after 9-11, most of this became issues focusing on surveillance. Surveillance became very important after 9-11, and that flowed into the surveillance of pathogens. Uh, as well, the, the almost militarization of the management of, of global health threats internationally. However, at the same time, a few countries started to play an alternative role, and you'll recognize their names because they're all in BRICS. Brazil was quite instructive in terms of the rolling out of antiretroviral therapy, quite a pioneer then after 1996. India was a leader in the manufacture of generic drugs, and the South Africans were quite successful in the Doha round early on, when it was still going, uh, to make room for those generic drugs and their parallel importation into poor countries. So interesting things have happened in this new multilateral global health management system. There are a few, and sorry, but these notes are all going to be available, but I'm aware of the time, and, and they are really just an aid memoir for me. They're for my benefit, not for yours. Um, but there have been fascinating developments over the last few decades in particular. And again, I don't, know to, I don't need to tell you this, especially after 1978 with the 
Alma Atta Declaration, Health for All, where health became a human right. It seems as though a perfect storm has, has been coming, multilateralization of global health, the setting up of multilateral institutions, the establishment of BRICS, a multilateral take on pathogen transfer internationally. Um, all of this has created a, a context, certainly by the 1990s, that was absolutely ready for a new way of seeing how we can govern uh, all of these issues. Unfortunately, once again, the BRICS countries, I don't think, have, have made great leeway uh, in doing exactly that. What we ended up with today, and I've got about five slides yet, can I have a time check? Am I doing all right? Um, is the era of partnerships today. It's certainly an interesting time to be alive and to be working in global health. In 2000, the Gates Foundation was established. By 2007, its budget far surpassed that of the World Health Organization. This is this emphasis on, on partnerships beyond this fixed Westphalian state-centric view, again emphasizing the need for multilateralization. There was an emphasis on technological solutions, still coming, of course, from the Gates Foundation, looking at the survival of women and children in particular as multipliers in global health and development practices in general. A new multilateral elite has come about, the H8 or the Health 8, with those organizations listed there as key members. So this goes some way in answering one of those questions that Judy mentioned, you know, which are those global actors that are important in a multilateral response to the challenges of managing or governing global health today. The question, however, is, and I think the Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Washington movement is a sign of this, that the more we multilateralize, the more we vest governance capacity in multilateral institutions, the more it excludes traditional democratic practice. Uh, voices have been going up in the global south for many decades for greater say in how the world is governed and how issues are governed. And if something as important, something as dramatic as global health is managed multilaterally, then where, who do you talk to? Where do you go if you are unhappy? Um, what about governance? Who is accountable to whom uh, in a global context? Very soon after the multilateralization became so prominent, uh, it became clear that we needed to respond to the problem of duplication. Different multilateral organizations were working in silos. There was a lot of waste. This was discussed at the Monterey meeting in 2002, and of course led to the Paris Declaration and the process of aligning overseas development assistance. So all of this illustrates that global health in itself has become a push for the institutionalization of various aspects of governance of, again, pathogens and responses to them. The last decade has been dramatic in terms of the establishment of institutions, uh, the writing of rules. The International Health Partnership established in 2007, adding to the H8 a range of new actors important to multilateral global health governance, focusing in particular on health systems uh, strengthening. And of course, the creation of the BRICS and the G20 will only increase the complexity of managing all of this, what looks like chaos to many people. So if we have been frantic, starting slowly in the mid 1800s with a conference on cholera, and over the last 20 years, and especially since November 1989, going not overboard, but certainly becoming frantic in terms of institutionalizing, creating multilateral institutions, creating new ways of governing, globes of health, uh, uh, global health. Maybe AIDS can help to make sense. Maybe AIDS can be a, a galvanizer for countries belonging to BRICS, certainly, other countries in the global south in terms of their place in the world. We have all these institutions, the ones mentioned there in the first dot point. We have the Health 8. There's a lot of money available, less than before, of course, but the stakes remain high. How do we align our activities, our spending, 
we still have very little coordination within countries between aid agencies. We need to understand the political mechanisms that make things happen. We need more discussions between countries that are served and countries that want to help. Now, HIV and AIDS has been instructive in creating some sense out of that chaos. In my own country, there's been quite an interesting debate. It ended about three, four years ago. But especially after 1998 and the establishment of a treatment action campaign, there was a fascinating national narrative discussion, huge differences going on in public health versus human rights responses to the epidemic. And that debate was used quite cynically by the Mbeki government as well as his detractors in establishing a foothold in terms of how health more generally should be managed in South Africa, not only HIV and AIDS. And that has led to a level of surprising sophistication in South Africa, not only about HIV and AIDS, but about gender issues, about questioning sexual culture in South Africa, difficult issues uh, to have national conversations about. But AIDS has been absolutely instrumental in doing that. I'm convinced that we can use health issues broadly as well as HIV and AIDS to make the most of both the health crisis in the global south as well as the global financial crisis. This is a spectacular time for learning. It's a spectacular time for transformation. And I think it provides an opportunity for the BRICS countries uh, to find a way in to the conversation that the grown-ups are having at the big tables in multilateral institutions elsewhere. It will be very difficult to deny a place at that table to a country that has 5.7 million HIV positive people and wishes to share its learnings about what it means to govern that. Um, I think it would be a mistake for BRICS to ignore global health as well as HIV and AIDS issues as an area of focus. It can be a fascinating, useful filter through which to have its conversations with the global north. I call that turning dread into capital, turning the negative consequences of this epidemic into something that can be used constructively in the engagement, certainly of countries like South Africa with the global north. We've done it before. Uh, South Africa did as I said before, interesting things in, during the Doha round in 2001, 2002, in changing the TRIPS agreement and allowing parallel importation of generic drugs. So I think AIDS has not been used sufficiently in niche diplomacy, or what we would call niche diplomacy. Even George W. Bush, and I don't know if this institution is a friend of George W. Bush, but you'll find very few friends in the Global South. Um, no one is blind to the fact that his one great foreign policy success that was accepted without any great discussion by the Global South was PEPFAR. Uh, AIDS diplomacy or health diplomacy, I think, served him spectacularly well uh, in that instance. And I think South Africa, par excellence, can use AIDS diplomacy as a, as a leitmotif to do a lot of other things as well. And BRICS can do that uh, also. For instance, we have a history of doing battle with large pharmaceutical companies. That battle isn't over. It's going to shift soon in terms of the medical technologies that become available. We can build on the Doha round successes around TRIPS. We can use AIDS as a motif around which to have talks, serious talks about amending or changing global trade rules for greater fairness, greater access to services, health as well as otherwise. We need to use HIV to have a serious conversation with the Global North about stealing our medical personnel, uh, our nurses and our doctors. Um, we can play the moral high ground card to a large extent by, by using HIV and AIDS. There are fascinating new transnational alliances forming and have been over the last 13 years around the issue of HIV and AIDS. We shouldn't lose the capital globally that that has generated. And maybe if we are successful at this by ourselves or with, within a forum like the BRICS, we can come up with a new southern model of cooperation and multilateralization. And I know the BRICS as an institution would find that, again, 
quite attractive, very seductive. So to go back to the three questions from Judy, and this is my last slide. The first one was, what is the importance of multilateral relationships to the engagement of the BRICS on global health issues? I think it's, it's extremely important. The BRICS is all about multilateralism. And if we look at the kinds of issues that have been multilateralized, it's a natural fit. I think multilateralism, multilateralization is quite an interesting area of study. And in South Africa, speaking for my own country, it's not really studied that much. So I know the University of Toronto is very strong on that, looking at the G8, G20, and so on. But it's an area where we can grow, I think, as the BRICS, as a project. Second question was, what are the priority relationships, organizations, or associations within the multilateral arena? I think in terms of global health, they were the ones that were mentioned there. The, the Health 8, the Health 8 Plus, certainly the G20, the G8, and BRICS seem to be instructive along with the World Trade Organization. And then on what themes and topics the BRICS are most, most engaged through multilateral channels, the short answer is that at the moment it's about global financial rules, using the the language again of post-colonial disgust, you know, about the development of underdevelopment, that kind of cushy language, uh, kind of new Marxist analyses uh, that we default to. The conversation about global health isn't really happening yet at the level of BRICS, and I think it's an interesting time for that precise reason to be working in this area and maybe to introduce it to the BRICS countries as an area where they can project themselves and their power, soft or hard, uh, internationally. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fori. Our next speaker is Dr. Yan Zhang Huang, who is a senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations. At the Council on Foreign Relations, Dr. Huang directs the Emerging Powers and Global Health Governance Roundtable Series. He's also on the faculty at the John C. Whitehead School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University, where he's an associate professor, a professor and the director for global health studies. In fact, at Seton Hall, he developed the first academic concentration among United States professional schools of international affairs that explicitly addresses the security and foreign policy aspects of health issues. Dr. Huang? Well, thank you, Judy, for that <laughs> generous introduction. And actually, I'm going to follow up uh, of, um, the Peter's presentation, actually, by focusing on the three questions that uh, Catherine um, um, raised. I think these are all very important, um, timely questions. Uh, the first question is, what is the importance of multilateral relationships to the engagement of uh, the BRICS on global health issues? And I'm going to actually um, reformulate a little bit because I think it raises the question why did BRICS countries engage multilateral institutions in global health governance? Uh, I will, um, and according to uh, some of the international relations scholars such as um, Helen Milner, well, this is essentially the three logics on you know, um, why countries engage in multilateralism. The first logic is essentially follows the so called principal agent model. The second is the uh, logic of hegemonic um, self-bonding. And the third one is the normative logic of appropriativeness. And, the f and I would like to add a fourth one, that is a pragmatic logic of opportunism. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let me go uh, <laughs> these four logics one by one. The first is the principal agent model. Uh, basically, uh, the countries decide to join or participate in these multilateralist institutions because well, this is like a choice for state to delegate its policy control or decision making to an international institution, in this case a multilateral institution. Uh, they decide to delegate this policy control because they do not they may, one of the reasons is because they do not have the knowledge or the ability to make the decisions as well as that international agent. Uh, so, and of course, but in order for that delegation to occur, why the 
principle in this case, but the BRICS countries, they must benefit from reducing the transaction cost uh, uh, or uh, resolving uh, collective action problems. In this case, we found indeed that is the case. Uh, for example, uh, uh, international organizations such as WHO you know, provides the knowledge or ability of uh, international health policy making. And also the cost of um, reaching agreements, balancing the wide range of uh, um, uh, interests and, and building consensus, you know, actually uh, was significantly reduced when uh, those countries engaged in a kind of stable, rule-governed environment associated with the, the deepening multilateralism. Uh, I'm going to use the, um, the China's example and actually, I'm going to use China as a, uh, the critical case for answering those questions, but I'm also going to um, uh, use some comparative um, cases. Uh, the, um, uh, the HIV AIDS crisis, right, the 2003 SARS episode, you know, highlight the role of multilateral organizations such as WHO in addressing global health challenges. So that explains why following the 2003 outbreak of SARS, China began to adopt a more uh, participatory approach to health within the multilateral international organizations. Right? So this is the first logic. The second logic um, is essentially, uh, I would we say, the hegemonic self-binding logic. You know, they basically, um, those powerful states or countries with these ambitions, well, this doesn't include uh, South Africa, but does include countries like uh, Russia, China, particularly China, you know, they may choose to pursue multilateralism as a means of demonstrating to others that they are not going to abuse their overwhelming influence. You know, they want to show the international society they are a responsible stakeholder, right? In, well, that's basically the law, the, the actually, um, uh, the, um, a thesis of David Lake in um, a publication in 2009. And in fact, again, well, we found that uh, in the case of China, uh, beginning in the early 1990s, you know, as part of its search for effective approach to allay the, fail, the feel of um, the rapidly rising uh, power, it's a rapidly rising power, Beijing actually increasingly turned to multilateralism in its foreign policy. Right? And that change is, of course, evidence is in its growing participation in multilateralist institutions at global, regional, even sub-regional uh, levels. And China's ratification of FCTC, the framework, um, um, the uh, framework um, control. Uh, Anybody? Convention, Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Sorry. Uh, uh, despite the, the strong, the, this political strength of its domestic uh, tobacco industry, you know, China actually ratified FCTC. Well, in, I think uh, partly uh, it wants to demonstrate its desire to be seen as a responsible emerging power. Uh, the third logic is a normative logic of appropriateness. You know, basically, a country, a BRICS country, for example, may adopt multilateralism because of these powerful norms that designated it as the most appropriate or legitimate means of pursuing uh, that country's foreign policy. Right? Uh, in fact, uh, yesterday I was um, um, actually teaching uh, in my uh, teaching of the, uh, the global health governance class, um, you know, I was uh, introducing the students all those, so the, the multi-polar in the global health governance, this is basically like an unstructured polarity situation with the proliferation of all the state, um, non-state actors. But if you compare uh, those multilateral organizations with non-multilateral organizations active in global health governance, you would find you know, this landscape is basically dominated by multilateral uh, organizations and institutions. When you have a global health landscape dominated by the multilateralism, what well, countries may feel the normative pressure to engage uh, in that um, multilateralist structure. Uh, so, uh, well, that is the case probably in China's negotiation uh, to, of the international health regulations into, uh, uh, um, in, the, uh, in 2005, for example, even though China objected to the HIHR 
on grounds of sovereignty, more especially the issue of Taiwan, and also the issue of uh, the surveillance reporting, right? Uh, these concerns did not impede uh, the, um, the, uh, the successful revision of the IHR, right? In part, I think that China was receptive to that normative, dominating normative pressures of multilateralism. Um, and finally, there's this pragmatic logic of um, uh, opportunism. Well, this is very easy to understand. Well, my friend uh, Jack Cho uh, wrote this piece on uh, foreign, foreign policy uh, a year ago, right, on China's billion dollar appetite, you know, basically talking about how China reaped the benefit of multilateral participation with little financial uh, contribution, right? Again, when the global health, uh, the global, China's participation in global fund is actually a perfect example, right? Uh, it uh, raked in nearly one billion US dollars in years from the global fund, but it only make a nominal yearly contribution of $2 million right, annually. So that uh, China actually recouped its spending, according to Jack, you know, by 60 times. You know, that is a very good deal, right? Uh, so uh, the um, <laughs> so um, and that logic, I thought, also applies to uh, the case of India, right? Uh, well, actually, if you uh, compare China to India in terms of the contribution to global fund, India is even more uh, adopted, even more pragmatic approach. That uh, so uh, to just to be fair to China, uh, so uh, the. <laughs> um, and also, if you um, look at these two countries, India and China, well, they. Uh, in terms of their attitude toward its status as a donor state and a recipient of global health uh, um, um, uh, fun, uh, the funding, right? India and China, they both seem to be, uh, they provide fairly open spaces to multilateral uh, actions, you know, but as donors, they prefer to engage in bilaterally, right? uh, even though they are becoming increasingly active donors uh, in multilateral settings. Um, so um, so that's, this is the, the four logics. And the second question, how many times, uh, minutes do I have? Because um, um, I don't want to be, uh, okay, that's fair enough. So second question is what are the priority uh, relationships, uh, organizations, associations within that uh, multilateral arena? I think uh, here we want to basically address two major concerns here. Right? The first concern is sovereignty, right? Because even though you have increasing interest uh, in multilateralism, but still that interest encountered this traditional resistance to shared sovereignty right? and the constrained policy autonomy right? that accompanies this collective uh, decision making in the multilateral setting. So that leads. BRICS countries and Beijing in particular, are uh, to pursue the multilateralism on a selective basis. Right? Uh, so there is actually sort of like a twin dynamics of receptivity and resistance. Right? Uh, they um, are very um, receptive uh, to um, programs, uh, the uh, multilateral part participation that are going to offer advantages for program expansion or reputation enhancement, but in the meantime, they resisted to those, um, uh, the, uh, the participation uh, that is going to clash with its normative uh, domestic structures, you know, uh, its own health system capacities. Right? Uh, so um, this is the first concern. The second concern is the uh, issue of power and influence. Right? If you look at actually China's participation in multilateralism, we found that the Beijing seems to pursue multilateral cooperation most enthusiastically, either with global multilateral settings where the dominance of the U.S. or its allies is weak, right? uh, or uh, participation in regional settings where it is the most powerful participants. Right? For the former, we found China's active, that explain why China is active at the global level in WHO, at United Nations, UNESCO, uh, and the, at the regional level, ASEAN Plus Three, um, Shanghai Corporation Organization, and East Asia Summit. 
right? Um, and in WHO, we know that uh, China's participation uh, in the group with 191 other members actually offers a more attractive alternative because its agenda is less likely or less um, easily dominated by the U.S. and its allies. Right? And that same logic also explains why China sort of avoids uh, uh, participating actively in uh, G8 uh, because uh, this 2008, for example, Japan you know, has played a leading role in this process. And um, so uh, this is the, um, uh, the, the two main concerns. And of course, that also I want to point it out because that involves, since that involves delegating uh, the policy control, you have to make sure the agent, right, that you delegate those policy control uh, sort of um, 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 does not you want to make sure they do promote uh, the preferences of the um, the principle. In this case, the uh, the BRICS countries. You, know, you want you don't you want to avoid situation of the agency slack, right? Uh, so that creates a dilemma for uh, the uh, the uh, the so-called principle. In this case, BRICS and agent. In this case, multilateral organizations or institutions. So in order to minimize that agency slack, right? Uh, the principle, in this case BRICS, must either appoint the, the um, uh, agents whose preferences are identical to their own or find ways to write a contract that uh, motivates the agents you know, and that, or make sure that agents follow uh, your, um, your policy preference. Um, the, well, that in this case of China's participation, WHO, seems that the problem is solved you know, with the Chinese national serving as a WHO DG, and uh, also uh, they, uh, given that China is concerned about uh, the issue of the, this Taiwan and the one China sovereignty issue, it has signed a memoir, uh, the memo of understanding with WHO uh, about uh, Taiwan's uh, participation. So that problem is solved. You know? so, so the paves way for China's active uh, uh, participation. And that participation, if you compare to uh, the South Africa, I found that this domain is quite uh, different, right? South Africa, um, especially uh, the, uh, uh, the Zuma administration, I'm not an expert on South Africa, it's just uh, some of my uh, premature observations, you know, seems to um, uh, retreat from the um, uh, leading role, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, leadership of um, uh, continental issues and reach out uh, to um, international partnerships, right, uh, such as uh, BRICS, right, uh, IBSA, right, that uh, involves a trilateral development uh, cooperation uh, instit uh, initiative um, involving countries such as South Africa, India, and Brazil. Uh, it does in, uh, uh, participate in WHO and UNAIDS and Gates Foundation also very actively. Uh, um, like China, but uh, it has this uh, priority or uh, focuses. But in addition to BRICS, IBSA, it also launched this FP uh, with other countries such as Senegal, France, uh, Indonesia, and Thailand, uh, the FPGH uh, initiatives by right, essential foreign policy and global health right, uh, in September 2006 to promote the use of health uh, uh, as this uh, lens for formulating foreign policy. And uh, so finally, the question, on what themes or topics is Brazil or this BRICS countries most engaged uh, through multilateral uh, channels? My, uh, again, was the uh, Catherine's uh, no better than I, uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, the, this, this the report on the key players, it seems to be uh, the case that even though these five emerging powers are conceptually Group together, and even though they frequently do cooperate, collaborate with each other on issues related to global health, right? Uh, they, um, each country seems to have approached global health governance issues uh, differently. Uh, Brazil, we know so far, is the most active, but right? it has demonstrated leadership on um, the global health rule, or ma rule making and a wide range of issues, including uh, the issue of uh, negotiation of FCTC. 
uh, universal access to HIV AIDS medications, uh, pharmaceutical intellectual property rights. Right? And uh, if you compare uh, Brazil with China, right, China is not as enthusiastic as Brazil in negotiating FCTC right, or um, the uh, issue of IHR. It was also not very enthusiastic. Right? Uh, but uh, uh, we know that they lobbied very hard to have a Hong Kong Chinese, well, have a Chinese national seated as a director general of the WHO. Right? Then this year, they actually again supported uh, Margaret Chang to be the WHO DGO. Actually, she became the only candidate uh, for the re re for the uh, election of the WHO DG. The, um, but its relationship with WHO focuses more on cooperation of infectious disease prevention and control. Right? Um, and um, in contrast to Brazil and China's strong interest in using the WHO as a critical venue uh, in global health governance, Russia and uh, India, uh, and maybe uh, to a less extent South Africa, appear to focus on uh, their overseas health outreach more at the regional level. Right? Uh, uh, Russia's, we know, Judy is, is the expert on that. Uh, uh, Russia's current engagement in global health um, revolves around health capacity building to fight against the spread of infectious diseases such as HIV AIDS and polio in Central Asia and work closely with multilateral institutions such as World Bank and the UNDP. Right? Um, and India, right, uh, despite its of efforts to build uh, health capacity in South Asia and Africa, uh, its participation in multilateral institutions uh, does not appear to be um, a very high uh, diplomatic uh, priority. I, I could be wrong. And, uh, but uh, I, I want to point out it was very active in uh, challenging uh, the, the, um, some of the existing international uh, health norms and rules, you know, for example, uh, the TRIPS agreement, uh, the uh, FCTC, where well, it was very uh, played actual leading role in negotiating the FCTC, uh, was more recently was also active uh, in uh, the agenda setting for the NCDs and non-communicable diseases. It succeeded actually to include, uh, for example, the issue of mental health in the uh, Moscow Declaration. Uh, and for uh, South Africa, the um, uh, the uh, it. Well, as Peter just uh, 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 presented, uh, it seems to have to be more interesting issue area of HIV AIDS diplomacy, right? Promoting innovative and uh, wide access to affordable medical products, vaccines, and health technologies right? uh, uh, through um, the channels, multilateral channels such as UNAIDS, GAIDS, and uh, WHO. So. Uh, to uh, quickly summarize, uh, uh, despite there's some common grounds, partnerships, agreements, the BRICS still approach global health in an individualistic, uh, more state-centric uh, manner. You know? So uh, as such, uh, we can expect those emerging powers right, to um, lead to a more a further a fragmentation of global health uh, institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we turn to Julia Kulik for a discussion of Russia. Um, Julia is a senior researcher for the Global Health Diplomacy Program based at the Monk School of Global Affairs in Trinity College and at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. She has researched and written on G8, govern G8 health governance for Africa, G8 global health governance, and Canada's global health strategy. She's been involved in advisory projects for the WHO, PAHO, and the Canadian government. Julia? All right. Thank you. My name is um, Julia Kulik. I'm the senior researcher with the Global Health Diplomacy Program at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs. Today I'm going to be speaking about Russia's leadership in governing global health, particularly non-communicable diseases, within the G8, G20, and the BRICS. 
If there was ever a time that Russia needed to take leadership in governing global health, it is now. Russia has a great and growing health challenge that due to its constrained resources and increasing inter interconnectedness with the outside world, it cannot solve alone. Its primary problem arises from the soaring burden of non-communicable diseases, its crumbling post-Soviet healthcare system, and its rapidly aging and declining population. These national health problems match poorly the dominant emphasis of the major global health governance institutions which target infectious disease led by HIV AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and polio. Russia is registering catastrophic levels of mortality, subsequently creating major gaps between itself and the rest of the Western world. The main explanation for this gap is the surge of deaths due to NCDs, particularly cardiovascular disease. Currently, deaths from cardiovascular disease are three times higher in Russia than in Western Europe. Although Russia may be rich in natural, natural resources, this wealth is not a substitute for human capital, and its demographic decline will inevitably have a significant impact on its development and international security. Russia does not stand alone as a net mortality society. In fact, three other G8 member countries, Germany, Japan, and Italy, have also experienced rapid population decline. The defining difference between Russia and these three countries is that the latter have sustained high quality systems of public health. Russia, on the other hand, has yet to finance major public health campaigns that could mitigate the impact of these diseases. This, however, is not the first time that Russia has faced devastating health challenges. In fact, Russia has endured problems with its health system since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Russia has also had a long, well-documented battle with infectious disease, particularly HIV AIDS, but also measles, tuberculosis, and the avian influenza. At the height of these challenges, Russia was motivated by its domestic health problems to make contributions at the international level. Despite the growing burden of NCDs within Russia and within the, partners it, within the countries it partners with in the G8, G20, and BRICS, there has been almost no attention paid to the economic and social costs of these diseases in the global governance forums. The G8, the primary forum in which, in which Russia has displayed the clearest leadership in governing global health, has failed to prioritize NCDs on its agenda or in its final summit documents. Although only minimal, the G20 at its meeting in Seoul recognized the link between economic stability and addressing NCDs. More, re more recently, at the BRICS Health Minister's meeting in China in 2011, the member countries paid particular attention to NCDs in a way that the other two forums have failed to do. <coughs> there has yet to be a significant response to NCDs within these respective global summits, but there is hope that Russia, following its role as host of the Global Ministerial Meeting on NCDs in Moscow in April of 2011, will take the lead in collaboration with its BRICS partners. The G8 and its member countries have been addressing global health since the late 1970s by first focusing on the challenges associated with hunger and malnutrition. It made its first commitment in 1980, giving health and safety top priority when dealing with spent fuels and the disposal of nuclear waste. The G8's focus from that time up until the 1996 Lyon summit was minimal, but the French hosted summit marked the turning point in the club's focus when it turned more globally oriented in the face of the introduction of diseases like Ebola and cholera in the developing world. Since 2000, the G8 took a major leap forward in governing global health across a number of dimensions. There was an increase in deliberation, the number of references to health in the club's official documents, decision making, the number of its health related collective commitments, delivery, the fulfillment of and compliance with those commitments, and the development of global governance, the creation of institutional, institutions dedicated to health at both the international and ministerial level. Of all G8 summits, health was most prominent in St. Petersburg. It was successful in producing a substantial report against the fight of infectious diseases, which acknowledged the devastating effects that they have on individual well-being, international economic development, and progress on the UN Millennium Development Goals. The report also highlighted challenges associated with limited availability of vaccines and treatment, lack of essential healthcare services, and the migration and shortage of healthcare workers. Russia displayed progressive leadership by extending an invitation to the members of the Outreach Five, Brazil, China, India, Mexico, and South Africa, as well as the World Health Organization. Russia was also successful in hosting a summit that produced the highest number of health-related commitments in summit history, and they themselves complying with those commitments with a score of 
While the G8 has not proven to be the forum for Russia, or any other member for that matter, to address NCDs, it has provided the clearest case of Russia's global health leadership. Russia is set to host again in 2014, and it has the opportunity to continue its trend in producing successful and substantial achievements in health. Three very similar conditions have emerged that seem to replicate the environment in 2006. First, Putin, who was instrumental in putting health on the agenda in St. Petersburg, has announced that he will seek a presidential term come the election in March 2012. Second, Russia is faced with a health threat that will almost certainly cause severe demographic, economic, and security challenges, this time from NCDs. <clears throat> and third, it has an opportunity to demonstrate international leadership by following up on its ministerial meeting on NCDs in Moscow in April of 2011 as part of the preparations for the UN high-level meeting. <clears throat> the G20, unlike the G8, has in fact acknowledged the global growing global burden of NCDs through the communique that was produced out of the Seoul Summit in November 2010. This, however, was the only reference to NCDs and one of the only references to health in the summit's documents since its inception. The G20 has yet to establish itself as a forum that fosters dialogue on issues like global health or as a forum that Russia has utilized to lead on such issues. The G20, comprised of the most powerful developed and emerging economies, was first created at the finance minister's level in 1999. It emerged as the premier summit forum to respond to the onset of the global financial crisis in 2008, when the G8 failed to fully recognize the increasing capability of the emerging economies. The G20's agenda quickly expanded after its first meeting in Washington to include issues like global market access, economic stability, and approaches to development beyond additional development assistance. In its first four meetings, the G20 made little or no reference to health in its official documents. On a number of occasions, the le leaders reaffirmed the importance of and their commitment to meeting the UN Millennium Development Goals, half of which are dedicated to improving the lives of people around the world, health of people around the world, sorry. The Washington communique also acknowledged the importance of addressing issues like disease as a means of promoting economic development. Attention to health was again minimal at the summit in Toronto in June 2010. However, the G20 did briefly mention the importance of strengthening social safety nets like public health care. At Seoul later that year, in addition to recognizing the barriers that NCDs present in improving productivity and skills development, the leaders acknowledged the disproportionate impact of the financial crisis on low-income countries and its role in slowing progress on the MDGs. At the most recent summit in Cannes in November 2011, there was hope that health and NCDs in particular would find its way onto the agenda, first as a reiteration of the club's commitment at Seoul, but also building on the Russian-hosted ministerial meeting in April and the UN high-level meeting in September. The Cannes summit did neither. Although the G20 has yet to address health in a major way, it has many elements that may lend itself well to becoming the next major forum to do so. Its reach extends beyond those networks accessible to the G8, and it's not limited by bureaucracy in the same way that formal institutions are, which may allow it to act much faster, especially in times of crisis. It represents 85% of the world's economy and two-thirds of the world's population, which gives it the representative legitimacy that the G8 is often criticized for lacking. Although the, oh, sorry. Uh, the G20 can be a key forum to respond to non-communicable diseases, as it has emphasized the in interconnectedness of economic development and health issues from very early on. NCDs represent a major economic burden to every G20 member within the club, and Russia is no exception. Although CAN did not advance a response to the prevention and control of NCDs, there is hope that Russia will provide leadership as host for the very first time in 2013. Russia was the first country to host the BRICS summit at the leaders' level in 2009. <clears throat> However, it did not seem to be the forum in which Russia would choose to govern global health. The forum arose as a vehicle for the major emerging market economies, like BRICS members, to become more equal players in global affairs with a goal to improve the global economy. The first two summits in Russia and Brazil made no direct mention of, to health. There were, however, references made to the health-related issues of agriculture, development, and poverty. At the third leaders' meeting in China of April, in April of 2011, the BRICS leaders, now with South Africa, made their first ever health commitment. It was a specific commitment to strengthen dialogue and cooperation in social protection, which included public health and the fight against HIV-AIDS. 
Here they also committed to hosting the meeting of their health ministers who would gather a few months later. This meeting seemed to be an appropriate forum in which BRICS countries could discuss non-communicable diseases. They acknowledged the challenges faced by all BRICS nations due to the increasing rates of NCDs and the need to strengthen health systems and remove impediments to access to medicines, treatment, and technology. At their meeting, BRICS health ministers agreed to meet again in conjunction with the UN high-level meeting on NCDs in New York and to establish a technical working group. Despite a slow start, the BRICS summit has arisen as a key forum to address global health and to address non-communicable diseases in a way that the other two forums have failed to do. No official documents were released out of the most recent summit in Cannes, halting momentum on the commitments made in Seoul, the BRICS in Beijing, and the UN in New York. It is unclear how Russia will lead within BRICS as it has not yet used it as a forum to govern global health. But it is set to host again in 2014 and there is hope that Russia will use its role as host of all three summits within the next few years to continue the momentum gained from its role as host of the ministerial meeting in April. In Moscow in April of 2011, Russia used the UN high-level meeting process to assume leadership in addressing NCDs when it hosted the global ministerial meeting in the lead-up to the high-level meeting in New York. Russia collaborated with 90 ministers and 155 delegates to acknowledge the socioeconomic impact of these diseases, discuss international strategies on prevention and control, and advocate for a framework for strengthening health systems. The Moscow Declaration, the meeting's official concluding document, outlined 48 commitments which focus mainly on integrating health into all sectors, strengthening health systems, and engaging in partnerships with private and civil society actors. Russia's role as host of the ministerial meeting signaled that it might continue to dedicate itself for better NCD governance through global symmetry. However, come the UN high-level meeting in September, there was no head of government or state representative from Russia in attendance. There were also a number of issues that were left inadequately addressed. Absent from the agenda were any specific targets and timelines, which proved to be an important catalyst in promoting global action and compliance in other forums like the G8 and the G20. The declaration at the high-level meeting also failed to include any references to TRIPS flexibilities, which would allow greater access to low-cost medicines for developing countries. Also absent was the commitment by leaders to invest any new money into combating NCDs, either through prevention or treatment, or solid mechanisms for accounting and follow-up. Thus, gaps in leadership and governance were still evident as the UN's high-level meeting came to a close. Russia and its BRICS allies now have an opportunity to take the lead, particularly since the disease burden only continues to get worse. By now, the global health community is familiar with the statistics affirming that NCDs account for 65% of deaths worldwide, 80% of which occur in low- and middle-income countries. Russia is clearly not alone in its struggle with these diseases. In fact, some of the most staggering figures come from its partners within BRICS, who risk digressing from emerging economy status if they are not addressed. In China, NCDs account for 85% of deaths, well above the average for the rest of the world. China now has the largest population of people suffering from diabetes, and its rates are increasing faster than those in the United States and Europe. By 2014, it is suggested that China will have more people suffering from Alzheimer's than anywhere else. Part of this trend can be explained by the country's rapidly aging population, but China has also failed to address risk factors like smoking, environmental degradation, use of illegal substances, and physical inactivity. China, like Russia, has long overlooked its public health care system in pursuit of economic growth, which has subsequently caused rapid declines in the health of its population. In India, the story is similar. It has high rates of diabetes and increasing rates of cardiovascular disease, which are striking people in the most productive years of their life. High rates of tobacco use and obesity, as well as occupational hazards and poor living conditions, have contributed to the rising burden of these diseases. India's healthcare system has made improvements in dealing with infectious disease, as well as maternal and child health, but health promotion and chronic disease prevention have yet to be properly addressed. In Brazil, 72% of deaths are due to NCDs, with neuropsychiatric disorders being the largest contributor. Unhealthy diet and physical inactivity are contributing to high rates of diabetes and hypertension. However, the Brazil example is slightly more optimistic. The successful implementation of anti-smoking and NCD prevention policies has meant that NCD mortality has been decreasing by a rate of 1, per, 1 to 8% per year. Brazil has also invested in the expansion of primary health care 
which integrates health into all sectors and includes individuals and communities in health promotion. The growing global burden of non-communicable diseases threatens the strong economic growth experienced by BRICS countries in recent years. The ongoing costs associated with loss of productivity, disease surveillance, and the production and distribution of medicines will inevitably lead to higher levels of inequality and poverty. However, the emerging economies of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa have offered innovative solutions for their domestic health problems that they can use to provide leadership in governing global health. In the 21st century, BRICS countries have become increasingly involved and influential at the center of global health governance through their contribution to the G8 as the Outreach 5, the G20, and the BRICS summits. These countries have moved beyond second tier status within the G8 to full and equal members of the G20 and founding members of BRICS. In struggling with their own domestic health problems, the emerging economies now have valuable lessons for the global community for governing NCDs. Brazil has a well-known successful HIV AIDS prevention care and treatment program which provides a leading example of an approach to epidemics by a middle-income country fraught by social inequality. Its program for uni universal access to treatment has caused a dramatic decrease in morbidity and mortality from AIDS. India is, has, is known to have a strong pharmaceutical industry that has produced and provided low-cost treatments to prevent epidemics in countries in Africa. The Serum Institute of India agreed to reduce the price of a vaccine that protects against five fatal diseases and distribute it to some of the poorest countries in the world through the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. South Africa has become the center of research and development, epidemiology, and pharmaceutical production within Africa. It has successfully battled the pharmaceutical industry to circumvent patent protections and allow for access to low-cost medicines. South Africa is likely to expand its domestic production of antiretrovirals and is considered a promising leader in addressing health challenges within Africa. Since the shocking outbreak of the severe acute respiratory syndrome, the Chinese government has invested significant resources in improving its ability to control infectious disease. China has created monitoring and reporting mechanisms at the district level to ensure that mistakes made during SARS aren't repeated. The Chinese government has also committed to giving its large rural populations priority and access to low-cost care, which is supported by its scientific capacity to produce innovative solutions. Russia has already demonstrated its willingness to lead in global health governance, particularly through its role as host of the 2006 St. Petersburg Summit and the 2011 Ministerial Meeting on NCDs. In the coming years, as Russia prepares to host a series of summits, the APEC in 2012, the G20 in 2013, and the G8 in BRICS in 2014, it can use its partnerships with the emerging economies to take action against the NCDs that burden their countries and the rest of the world. The limited participation of leaders at the UN high-level meeting and the absence of ambitious results mean Russia must look elsewhere to global mobilize global health governance on behalf of its core domestic concerns. It can do so by constructing a strategy to bring NCDs onto the agenda of the plurilateral summits it hosts over the next few years. In this strategy, its BRICS partners could serve as core allies, as China, Brazil, and India, and soon South Africa will face the same challenges of NCDs as Russia does. Although there are many differences among the big four NCDs of cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and chronic respiratory disease, they share a similar property with HIV AIDS in that they are both chronic. The BRICS countries have all struggled with the onset and spread of HIV AIDS in recent years, which has meant a scale up of their health systems to treat this disease. Brazil has led the BRICS countries in its battle with pharmaceutical companies to obtain low cost access to antiretrovirals to fight against HIV AIDS, which will be important moving forward on NCDs as access to medicines and treatment is an essential component of disease control and prevention. Another key element that went into the scaling up of healthcare systems in response to HIV AIDS is the continuity of care. Both HIV AIDS and NCDs require the coordination of services from the primary care to the tertiary level over a number of years. Sustaining a continuous relationship with healthcare professionals over time can lead to fewer hospitalizations by focusing on education and prevention and identifying problems early on. The strengthening of healthcare systems to respond to the spread of HIV AIDS also focused on community and family based care. This approach to healthcare emphasizes greater coordination between pediatric and adult care, the linkage of family medical records, and family member outreach. Community and family based care approaches can be effective in managing risk factors within families and recognizing the disproportionate impact of NCDs on certain communities. 
Together with the lessons learned from the recent struggle with infectious disease and their desire to demonstrate leadership within global symmetry, Russia, in partnership with its BRICS allies, can take the lead in producing innovative solutions and strategies combating, for combating NCDs. With the upcoming summits hosted by Russia, there is an opportunity for Russia to prove itself capable of this role as social and economic costs continue to rise due to these diseases. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julia. All right, we have a little over 15 minutes in this session remaining for questions and discussion, so I'd like to open the floor. Um, and as you make a question or, or a comment, could you please identify yourself and your affiliation? There's a microphone coming your way. Hi, uh, good morning. Thank you very much. A very interesting presentations. My name is David Greeley. I'm with an international development health organization called FHI 360, uh, based here in, in Washington, North Carolina. Um, a lot of you, and I'm sure the panelists for, uh, on India and Brazil will also say the same thing in terms of the success the BRIC countries have had in terms of increasing access to low-cost medicines through trips and various uh, uh, work with the WTO and, and, and intellectual property. Um, as uh, these countries are emerging and want to demonstrate that they're part of the first world, if you will, where is the investments in R&D for new medicines, vaccines, and diagnostics, again, sometimes for the infectious diseases, but elsewhere as well, that would show a leadership role uh, that these countries um, can provide going forward. July, uh, July 2011, and uh, this is the issue of the uh, access to medicine, you know, in the, uh, through the, uh, the Beijing Declaration, health ministers uh, from BRICS countries pledged right, to um, transfer the technologies, you know, to um, uh, make sure the, uh, the uh, medics, the, uh, uh, the vaccines, the uh, technology, medical technologies, the um, uh, the, um, the cooperation in the um, in the I and D uh, research and development in medical products, and uh, I, in fact, uh, I noticed that uh, Russia recently putting announced the plans to uh, make Russia a uh, significant player uh, in this field as well. Obviously, that implies more significant funding. Uh, in that area, and China, of course, has been um, uh, very um, uh, 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 active in that as field as well. Although you know, we have to point out that China is the, in this case, is not um, the always. They have problems producing their own innovative patented drugs. You know, each year they have you know hundreds of thousands of so-called new drug applications to the SFDA, but uh, probably more than 99% of them are just, just uh, <laughs> uh, the changing ingredients. is not real uh, innovative or new drugs. You know, so, uh, and for South Africa, they also they have um, built a, a, um, um, the, uh, the, uh, beefed up this research and development capacity with the uh, establishment of that uh, program called, I forgot the name of the, the re for the research and uh, development uh, also. Uh, I think there's, there's some uh, in strong interest is there, you know, although I'm not sure, you know, that uh, whether this is going to be done on an individual basis or on a partnership, uh, based on their partnerships. And what I s have seen so far is still this is more uh, state, still state-centric, you know, individualistic approach. Peter or Julia? So I, I found that uh, in recent years, Found it, private foundations in particular have focused on dedicating resources to resource and development. Uh, just a quick comment, because I think it's not necessarily that the resources aren't there, but um, that there needs to be some sort of accountability mecha mechanism to ensure that the resources are dedicated to the appropriate initiatives and diseases, um, to ensure that diseases like the n n neglected tropical um, diseases aren't um, excluded. So that's all I would add. 
South Africa's gross expenditure on research and development is way below 1% of GDP, so we're not doing well. And But comparatively speaking, we're the champion in Africa of that. I think it would a pooling of resources, not only money amongst the BRICS countries would be the way to go. South Africa has substantive experience in legal battles around, both domestically as well as multilaterally, access to medications and looking at the structural dynamics there. India is spectacular in manufacturing. Brazil in terms of also manufacturing and, and distributing and, and policy making uh, in terms. So I think a pooling of resources, not only money, uh, might be an interesting area for BRICS multilaterally as a body uh, to explore. Um, the pull will be towards infectious diseases at the moment, I think for, for the foreseeable future. Um, so I think within BRICS there should probably also be some priority placed on the NCDs given the change in demographics, certainly I think something very few people in South Africa are talking about is the the lower mortality levels that we're experiencing. I think we're, we're also going to see a significantly aging population fairly soon, older people on ARVs. Um, so there's, there's another storm coming. May I just do it? Well, I forgot to actually talk about India, you know, actually this is the, actually this is the important act. I also said that this is still pretty much state-centric probably India is exception because in the case of India, it has a very robust private sector. In fact, the Indian uh, health minister in the uh, Beijing meeting pointed out uh, the difficulties of transforming technologies uh, for making vaccines and medical products is that the cannot make this thing all by itself. You know, this is not just like state behavior because it has, uh, the decisions to be made by the, the private sector. Actually, it pointed out that as an obstacle for uh, further cooperation uh, in this area. Sorry, one last thing. Um, I think it would also be worthwhile if BRICS can be used as a forum to look at technology transfer protocols around pharmaceuticals in particular some kind of patent bank, uh, I don't know. Um, there was something else, but I can't remember now. Thank you very much. My name is Hernan Rosenberg, and I'm uh, formerly with the, retired from Pan American Health, uh, but I'm also one of the founding fathers of the Global Fund. But I can talk now without footnotes because I'm independent. So. Um, I, w I think that the, 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 there's some important topics that were issued, but I think that we should develop a little more on those. The issue of governance. Uh, the global fund, the important part of the global fund is, is the first hybrid. In other words, has a, has a governmental structure that both includes governments and the civil society. And, you know, sometimes the difference between honeymoon and rape is discussable. And in this case, it, it has evolved both ways. Uh, and I think that uh, this is very important because how do you, uh, the, the, what has not been resolved is the issue where the government is the government. Who is the civil society? And I think this is particularly important in what uh, your main business, uh, Peter, the difference between the participation of the civil society involved with the AIDS business to those with malaria and TB is phenomenal. I mean, there's no such thing as representation of the civil society of the other two, which represent probably most of the poor people of the world. I mean, not that it's, it's very democratic, but uh, uh, I think that uh, this is a, a key issue that has not been dealt with properly. Uh, that's point number one. Point number two I wanted to make is that the way we have tended to solve these issues is with the snowball effect. In other words, we're not satisfied with something working. We add a new institution, but we don't disengage the previous one. So then this institution is spending a lot of time fighting for territory rather than doing, you know, whatever they're supposed to be doing. So I think that's, a, that's, that's another point that, that I wanted to raise. And uh, the third point that, that uh, I think is important to, to keep in mind here is that the current problems faced by, say, the Global Fund stem precisely from this issue of mandates that sometimes are not thought over to the end. So for example, the fact that 
some people are probably abusing the leeway that is given to some civil society institutions. This is true, but this was foreseen by some of us, but not necessarily taken care of. And I think that uh, at the level of the global, uh, and I th uh, at the global uh, uh, governance of public health, this becomes a very big issue. Uh, I happen to agree with most of what the, uh, uh, the, the foundations are, are, are pushing. And as some foundations are bigger, have a bigger budget than WHO. But what if I didn't agree with them? What, 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 what can I do? I mean, I think foundations, you know, the, whoever donates the money is entitled to do whatever they want. But is that the way to run global business? Uh, so I think that those are points that I wanted to highlight on this one. Thank you. That's, we might be more efficient if we collect a couple of other questions before we go back to the speakers. So, Ines? Thank you. Um, very good presentations. Thank you very much. Um, is there any consideration of what Cuba is doing in cooperation with Cuba? I know last week, I think it was, they signed an agreement with China for the production of medicines using biotech um, research from both countries and uh, looking towards marketing elsewhere, uh, as well as within their own countries. And a lot of the things that Julia raised at the end about uh, things that need to be done to improve the health systems um, dealing with the NCDs are things that Cuba has done. Of course, their system has deteriorated considerably because of lack of money, but there are a lot of lessons that can be learned from that experience. So I'm just wondering if there is any consideration. Just one or two more. Um, on the aisle. Yeah. Hi. I think it's on. Thanks. Uh, my name is Brad Titel with uh, Global Health Strategies. We're an advocacy consultancy and we're spending a lot of time these days focused on uh, engaging the BRICS more in global health issues. And uh, as everyone referred to in their session, the BRICS are continuing to wrestle with a huge number of domestic health challenges. And so, you know, at the same time, we're looking to them more and more and asking them to take on a greater leadership role uh, in global health, both in terms of the dialogue, but also to invest increased resources in global health and assist poorer countries because the traditional donors are, you know, starting to cut back with the global financial crisis. And I was just interested in hearing everyone's thoughts on sort of how do you strike the balance there? Because, you know, coming from an advocacy perspective, in South Africa there's a lot of work going on to get the government to help its own people get better access to health. How do you then balance the advocacy that you want to do to get South Africa to take a better leadership role globally? And same thing with China and Russia and with India and Brazil. How will the governments be able to strike that balance and can they? Hi, my name is Mike Aja Dudley. I'm a student at Washington University in St. Louis, and I just got back from some time with the American Chamber of Commerce in China. And um, my question is that over the past few years, we've seen that at times China's reluctance and lack of transparency has global health ramifications. If you look at SARS and more recently avian influenza, how can we use the BRIC as a form to leverage China, not just to participate in a multilateral setting, but to look inwardly and understand that its, um, its internal health problems have ramifications, particularly in Asia and the rest of the world. All right, we have a pretty rich menu of questions here, ranging from uh, institutional governance to the role of Cuba, uh, to the relationship between these countries' domestic health challenges and their uh, global behavior, and then uh, questions about the use of the BRICS format as a tool to influence China's behavior. So why don't we just take responses in the order that the, uh, the panelists first spoke. So Peter? About two minutes each. In terms of representation of bugs, um, malaria, tuberculosis, HIV and AIDS, Global Fund. We know Global Fund is supposed to look after all three. All the pressure is on HIV and AIDS. Uh, if, uh, certainly on, in South Africa, there's no conversation about malaria, although it's a larger killer on the African continent than the other epidemics. Um, that said, the link between tuberculosis and HIV and AIDS has now been written quite explicitly into the latest national strategic plan that was announced last week on the 1st of December in South Africa. And it will now probably be as hard to divorce TB from HIV and AIDS as it was during the Mbeki era to divorce HIV from AIDS. 
Um, so certainly in the South African case, TB and HIV seems at the policy document level at least to now have coalesced. You know, the, it's it's viewed as a single, not as a single epidemic, but it, it comes very close to that. So the terrible twins are managed. Malaria, complete silence uh, on that. So that is a, a tacit epidemic. Um, I would agree that the Global Fund should be making when it makes a commitment, it must be a multi-generational commitment. Um, there's a lot of anger, I think, in the developing world around round 11 and the reduction in funds that are made available from the global north developed countries. Again, instead of the global south moping about this, maybe we can use that anger, create a movement for social justice rather than only HIV and AIDS specific screaming people are sick of AIDS, you know, they don't want to talk about it, there's no good news. Uh, they, they, it's, it's not a win situation. Um, so maybe maybe some of that energy can be can be harnessed and, and channeled somewhere constructively. Um, but you're absolutely right, it does raise the issue of accountability in governing the, the global fund. Um, who's, who's responsible for the global fund? Uh, it's very easy in the Global South to just put your fist in the air and scream about it, and that's what the Global South is doing. So, um, In terms of Cuba as an example, South Africa loves Cuba for many reasons, and Cuba is used as an example in terms of health personnel and capacitation and training in particular. During the previous health minister's disastrous tenure, uh, she shifted the tertiary education. Well, there were there were talks. I don't know if it, anything ever came of it, Marian, of of reducing the amount of years that you can need to study to become a medical doctor, basing it on a Cuban model. And then South Africa, since 1994, has been importing Cuban medical personnel as a kind of a South-South Cuban health diplomacy initiative uh, that's worked extremely well, I think, for for both countries. So it's. It's been going well on, on that front, but not in terms of health system strengthening in terms of any sustainable initiative. Um, and then, Brad, the, the question around domestic and global tension, there will only be a great pull. I think the irony in South Africa is that the governance push will be towards being seen to do the right thing at the global level rather than any great imperative to provide these services at the domestic level for the simple reason that health is number 18 or number 16. It's, it's in the double digits in terms of what the South African electorate wants to talk about and what's important to them when they vote. It's not, you know, jobs comes first, uh, other, other issues are first. HIV and AIDS and, and health issues really tumble down. So. Health is useful multilaterally, globally, but not so much domestically. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to address some of the questions given the constraints we have here. Uh, the first is about the issue of the civil society um, participation. Sorry. Uh, the first question is on um, the uh, participation of civil society um, in um, international organizations, uh, multilateral institutions. Uh, the um, Well, actually, the... Uh, I, my presenting is focused on the state actors, you know, this, especially as far as the, uh, the BRICS is concerned. It's the reason because, to my opinion, or in my uh, humble opinion, I would say, the, um, the participation of civil societies of the BRICS countries still not very, still not very prominent. You know, that, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not an expert on Brazil, you know, obviously there has lots of the NGOs, the civil society seems to be very robust, but in China, one of the reasons of lack of participation of civil society, international health cooperation is the lack of civil society participating itself in uh, the, uh, the health arena, you know, because the, you know, we saw that this absence of C, uh, the civil society in fighting H, uh, uh, the um, H1N1, in SARS, this is totally absent. Well, there might be some uh, health promoting uh, NGOs in HIV AIDS prevention and control, but still they're very weak, they're very small, 
uh, in size and in number. You know, so how could you expect them to participate internationally, right? Uh, so compared to uh, the uh, the developer countries, you know, I mean, the, uh, they they have a very robust society participation. You know, as we know that Gates Foundation this is itself is like a game changer, right? But uh, we don't see the counterparts in the uh, BRICS. Um, the second question is on what well, the BRICS uh, the uh, Bra uh, uh, question on the uh, how to balance the domestic health challenges and international health participation. Well, that is, of course, a, a concern here. But so far, my impression that uh, this has not prevented uh, uh, Russia and South Africa of um, um, uh, making more um, contributions, significant contributions, increasingly significant contributions to global health. Right? Russia is already determined to be a donor country, and South Africa uh, recently established its own sort of like uh, a USAID, the, the, uh, U, uh, USAID, its own version of development agency for international cooperation. Uh, obviously, they want to expand its role uh, in uh, international health cooperation. Uh, and China, uh, it um, is still very hesitating um, in um, chipping uh, more in international health cooperation, but that is not because of the international, largely not because of the inter internal health challenges. It's basically all those internal political logic and foreign policy logic. You know, for example, you know the conspiracy theory, you know, sort of prevents China from shouldering more responsibilities in international health. Um, uh, but uh, uh, over time, I see this factor will increase. In fact, I saw a very uh, recently there's the criticism, that the uh, netizens of the Chinese donating uh, these school buses to Macedonia. There's a very strong criticism based on say we haven't even addressed our own problems, our own case even don't have access to the school bus. Why did you donate the school bus to Macedonia? That's ridiculous. Uh, so you know, I think this factor is going to become more prominent concerns in um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the decision making uh, on international health cooperation. And finally, this issue of lack of transparency, uh, reluctance uh, uh, of China to participate. Uh, uh, I, I think I recently I published a piece in Foreign Affairs on China's health crisis. I pointed out this issue indeed exists, uh, but largely that is because of China's um, the own governance problems. You know, we could attribute to its political systems, you know, that, the civil society, uh, state society relationships, bureaucratic fragmentation, all these internal problems. But uh, that said, uh, Ex inter international factors could uh, play an important role. We saw that in SARS, right? WHO could indeed play very, uh, actually, a significant role simply by naming and shaming, right? But um, um, I probably shouldn't say that. Uh, I wish uh, that uh, the uh, WHO could uh, use that same uh, instrument uh, during the uh, 2009 H1A1 uh, crisis. Thank you. Uh, okay, just to uh, address the first question, I don't want to repeat myself too much about um, the issue of accountability, but um, within the global summits, we've seen an increasing role of civil society, particularly at um, the Muskoka summit when there was the introduction of the Maternal and Child Health Initiative, which was heavily influenced, influenced by um, religious-based civil society organizations, and then also the role of private foundations. And I think that there, there is a concern that private entities have too much control uh, over uh, the global public good of health. And um, because civil society and private institutions aren't as transparent as governments are, then there needs to be some sort of way to ensure that their interests are, are kept in check. Um, and then just to follow up on the balance between domestic health challenges and their role globally, it's something that we've looked at a lot within the G8 research group um, because we find that uh, national health problems actually promote countries' involvement in governing global health uh, and leading in particular. And I think although they may be constrained by resources, they still have the ability to influence 
agenda setting, for example, and um, their role as hosts, I think, plays a big part in contributing to that. So. All right, thanks very much. We'll now take a short break and reconvene at 11 o'clock for the next panel on regional interactions and regional cooperation. Let me thank you for your attention and for your excellent and insightful questions. And most of all, thank our panelists for a fascinating discussion this morning. <laughs>